Good evening. Good evening. Oh, that, how did that sound to y'all? That I mean, there's a lot of good energy in the house tonight. So, good evening. Good evening. Oh, that sounds much better. I almost forgot where I was. All right. Um, I am. My, well, my name is Jack Hill. I'm the head of the middle school here at Cambridge Friends School. Can you hear me okay in the back? There's an echo, sort of an echo sound. Are you good? Okay, great, great. Uh, I'm the head of the middle school. Uh, I'm the assistant head for external affairs. Um, and I am just so honored to be on this platform, sharing the microphone with, uh, with these four women who have done just extraordinary work uh, around the country and around the world. Um, and I want to say that they, that they are not smart. They are brilliant, in the words of Michelle Obama. You can clap for that. Um, so, and it's really important for me to, to say that, because um, I'm such a fan of, of all of these, young, these women. And, um, you know, we strive to uh, offer an outstanding education here at Cambridge Friends. And a lot of people put in a lot of work today to make this talk possible. And so I want to acknowledge Diane Margoli, if she's in the back. Um, you can give her a round of applause. Um, David Tierney, who's in the back, our head of school, who has provided the platform. And just our teachers are in the back, our parents. Um, you know, just thank you to all of you. And so let's, let's begin the conversation, yes? All right, so just to let you know, um, I start every talk the same way. Um, I am the uh, grandson of a Baptist preacher, okay? And culturally, uh, when we hear something that we really like. Jen, Jen, push that microphone away from you. Yeah, Jen, push that over towards them, and they can use it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That better? A little, little echo sound there. Um, when, when, when you hear something you like, it's okay to say amen, right? There's some call and response, and that's okay, well, that's okay with us, correct? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Um, and we're going to start the conversation, and I think the, the title of this talk is Our Deepest Concerns, A Conversation on Anti-Racism in America. And so we're going to dig deeply into their lives, their work, and their deepest concerns. All right, and so I hope that you enjoy the conversation because I've been waiting a long time to have this conversation. And I want to also say that this is really um, a product of what a community has produced, particularly here at Cambridge Friends School. And you can clap for that, really. Perry. Amani and she, we were talking about just sort of the landscape and how things, some things look the same and there's sort of a sense of nostalgia. Um, can you guys hear me still? Yeah, there was yes. a sort of a sense of a nostalgia walking through the halls and being back in the community with us. And we're just so proud of our alumni who are doing excellent work around the country. Uh, and again, it's my highest honor to be, to be on this platform with all of you. And so welcome back. Welcome back home, I should say. <laughs> welcome home. Uh, you always have a place at home, as my mom would say. Uh, so let's, let's start the conversation. And again, I want to give a few introductions. Um, first, we have Dr. Amani Perry, author and scholar. Um, she really needs no introduction. And, you know, she she uh, is a prolific writer, an award-winning uh, biographer, memoirist. I mean, you name it, she has done it. Uh, please give a warm welcome. <laughs> we got Dr. Carrie Greenwich, who is a professor and author, director at Greenwich. I say Greenwich, Greenwich. Uh, that's correct, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'll make sure I'm right, because I got to get that right now. Yes. Um, I've been in independent schools too long. So <laughs> but uh, director of the American Studies program at Tufts University, uh, a prolific scholar, uh, an author in her own right, and uh, I'm so happy to have you with us. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Kristen Greenwich, who is, <laughs> who 
as a playwright, an award-winning playwright, has done prolific work um, uh, with, with plays and has really just changed form and, and has really contributed to, to plays in such an essential way and has really captured black life. Let's give her a warm round. <laughs> And Caitlin Minich, who is the, is the baby? The baby of the group. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 40 years, but yes. <laughs> now, I didn't describe you that way. Somebody else mama did earlier. Um, who is a prolific novelist, an award-winning novelist, um, a memoirist, and I say a storyteller and a truth teller and speaker. I'm so happy to have Dr. Imani Perry, Dr. Carrie uh, Greenidge, Kirsten Greenidge, Caitlin Greenidge, they are in the building, y'all. Yes. Uh, so Amen. We'll have a quick conversation. I, and I want to start, um, and there's so many places to start uh, in asking questions uh, about your personal lives. Um, and, uh, and I want to be, of course, vulnerable for a moment. I was raised by a single mother myself. I came from Baltimore City. And um, when I think about her storytelling and the stories that she shared with me um, and what it meant, what black life meant in Baltimore, um, and to appreciate to, to, to the tools that she provided me and appreciate, appreciation and affirming who I was as a, as a black male was so essential to my growth and development. And so I think all of you write about black life and black people uh, because you, you love us, and that comes out in your work. And so I want to I acknowledge that because that's really important because we live in a country where uh, blackness as a culture is celebrated, but America at times does not <laughs> like black people. Uh, and so that's a, can, is that, can, did I hear it? Yes. Amen? Yes. I thought I heard yes. it. Um, so we've got to talk about anti-blackness uh, in America. And, um, and I think that's a, an essential part to anti-racism. I, I want to frame that conversation. But I want to start with, with your feelings about that and, and really staying true to self, the celebration of black life and culture. And any one of you can take this, this question. Um, how are you, what, what's your take on anti-blackness in America today in, the, in its many forms? And how have you used your work and your voices to um, dismantle uh, a narrative, right? Uh, a sort of a single narrative about black people. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in hearing your take on that. I'm looking at, I'm looking down at Dr. Perry, <laughs> but, but. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think, so anti-blackness is a term that in some ways gained currency um, in the last decade or so, so to distinguish um, anti-blackness as a very particular dimension of American racism. Um, one that um, even, I mean, it, it, and I just, as a preface, I'll say, one of the difficulties about addressing racism in the United States is that Americans are very, as Baldwin said, addicted to a kind of innocence an evasion of the recognition of their racism in practice. Um, and so, and that has a very particularized dimension for black folks. When you look at um, researching virtually every potential body, whether it's sociology, economics, schools, employment, market research, when you see racism in practice, it is always most aggressively practiced towards black people. Right? Uh, and we add another dimension that one of the lessons of um, Americanism and the racial hierarchy is that there's supposed to be, there's an investment and a reward for distinguishing oneself from black people. Right? Uh, and as a consequence, you have these sort of layers of efforts to distinguish, so that you have sort of the generalized prospect of racism. And then you have layers of what, what I refer to as the politics of distinction, right? So um, I, at least I'm not that, right, right? And that happens along lines of class, it has along, along various lines of racialization. Um, and it becomes difficult, particularly in the way we talk about 
diversity and multiculturalism to actually point to the full panoply of the ways in which racism against black people is enacted in part because it is not acknowledged that there's a very particularized animus towards black people that is pervasive and that, in fact, even some black people hold on to. Yeah. Um, um, I was just going to reiterate that by saying that um, if you take a historical view and you, you look at all this stuff is, is part of the historical processes under which we all live. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, particularly in 2019, we try to take everything out of sort of the historical context mm -hmm. and we try to act as though um, this political moment we're currently in is somehow abhorrent and new. Mm -hmm. um, and when really, from a historical perspective, if you're talking about anti-blackness, that that's a, a feature of the way that American systems, American economy, American politics have functioned. And so once you start to look at that from a historical perspective, it starts to tear away at the idea that somehow um, anti-blackness is, um, is sort of an anomaly, um, that somehow it's separate from Americanism. Um, and that's not to be fatalistic, but it's to look at and reckon with the history, the historical context in which we live. Um, in terms of how it sort of affects my work, I would say that I was never somebody who set out to like, right the wrongs of all black people in my work, but I am somebody who has always been interested in why it was that the stories I knew about black people were not portrayed anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, as a child, my mother, who's in the audience, was from uh, Boston. My father is from the West Indies. And growing up in the 80s, it was very much that somehow that story wasn't told. I think, I think it's changed a lot now, but that had a dynamic. We were from Boston and New England, and that wasn't told. Um, there were dynamics of our neighborhood and the black people we knew that I didn't often see told. Um, and so I think one of the, one of the consequences of anti-blackness as a historical process and as a, a construct generally is that we don't see a lot of, we, we have a very narrow way of what we think blackness is. And so in terms of how it's informed my work, I would say it's looking for um, black stories um, that otherwise wouldn't be told or wouldn't be told in a way that's nuanced um, and were, or would be told in a way that was um, uh, not doing justice to the fact that there's sort of these layers of, of African Americanness and blackness in the United States. Um, yeah, I would just say, uh, building off of what uh, Amani and Carrie have said, that in my own work, I sort of think of it in terms of um, who it is that I am writing for, um, and the answer to that question has changed over time. Um, I think right as my first novel was coming out, I was doing a lot of interviews with other um, writers, and I had the real distinct pleasure of getting to interview um, Casey Lemon, who is, of course, a really brilliant writer. Um, and in his work throughout and in the interview, you know, going on like, I guess like this was six years ago now, he's, he said to me, you know, I write for us and I write for, and that is the, the primary person who I write for first. And to sort of have that freedom to know that I'm writing for black people first and foremost, um, means that the places where I go in my work, um, have opened up tremendously. Um, and I also sort of think of it in terms of, um, I was also really lucky to do a project with and to interview the visual artist Simone Lee and her work. Um, you know, she she makes these figures and uh, these figures of Black women, um, these figures without eyes, and it's all sort of about the interiority. It's very um, specific decision on her part. It's about the inward gaze um, back in herself and the freedom to be as um, idiosyncratic and as specific as possible. Um, and for me, um, following that path that maybe is not um, understandable or resonant or recognizable to everyone, sort of rejecting this idea of universality. I think a lot of times in creative work and artistic work, there is a fetishization of this idea of the universal, um, which I would push back against and sort of ask, what are we saying is universal? And in fact, there is um, real treasure to be found in the incredibly specific 
um, and the incredibly narrow. Um, I mean, just personally, that's one of the reasons why I read and look at art and sort of all those things. I'm looking for experiences that are um, different from my own, from perspectives that are completely um, almost alien to my own. Um, so as an artist, following that path of um, particularity and, um, and the self is a huge part of um, what, how I think that my work sort of addresses this idea of anti-blackness. Yeah, I think as an artist, um, I come to this question of uh, thinking about how I choose my stories and um, having to be very conscious of the stories I decide to spend my time on. Um, I think uh, rejecting the idea of the universal is really key um, to piggyback on what Caitlin has just said. and. Um, I think in the theater, constantly thinking about the white gaze and um, where my stories end up, having to reconcile that uh, I have to take into consideration the white gaze and the idea of anti-blackness, even when that white gaze might not intentionally um, realize that it might have tinges of anti-blackness within it. Um, uh, and marry that with the type of stories I want to tell um, and people's um, internalized racism um, and how it affects the stories I want to tell and the stories I might want to tell in the future. And could someone explain the white gaze for, for folks who may not know what, what that means? How would you define the, the, the white gaze? Uh, the lens with which uh, people who are not of color, you are of color. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're, I think it also has to do with our medium. So Kirsten, you're a theater artist, which means that you are both aware of like your work, what you're creating in your mind, but then also what you're doing has to be staged and has the input of your director, your set designer, your costume person, your actors, your music stylists, the lighting people, you have like uh, 25 different visions to meld to make your vision um, uh, staged for a person. And then also you have a literal audience for your work who you see interacting with your work, which is very different from what I do, which is like I'm writing in a room by myself and I, I have an editor, but I don't have that immediacy of um, reaction and feedback. Um, and so I think that also contributes to how you think about um, how those things come out in your work. And it's interesting because I think you can, you can interrupt the work if you're so focused on the, the, white, the white gates. Um, I, I, when I think about the conversation, I'm thinking about Toni Morrison, um, who we recently lost and um, just was a, a titan um, and a cultural critic. Uh, and someone who just really understood um, how to present black life and culture. Um, but it can also, as Tony Morrison would say, um, thinking about you know, that in, in the production of work can interrupt how you present the work. Um, she, and she gave an example, which was Invisible Man, uh, in, a, in, a, in an interview. And she said, well, invisible to whom, right? Um, you know, and so it gets to my, my, next, my next thought. Um, and Caitlin, I wanna put you on the spot okay. real quick. <laughs> um, you, you write these very semi-biographical um, bi memoirs. Um, I remember even telling your sister one time after I read one, I was like, man, that was dope. <laughs> the way she just kind of you know, threw that all together. Um, and it was, it, it really, it's, it's, a, it's a fresh voice, I think. Thank you. Um, it's a very simple but complex way of writing. And if anyone who has ever studied writing, to get a sentence down to the core and really say exactly what you want to say is so difficult to do. <laughs> and you know, so um, yeah, yeah. And it's it's it, it feels like a memoir in many ways, but but you're. But it has a purpose. It's going somewhere. And most people would say, "Well, most writing is always going somewhere. It has purpose to it." But it's very deep. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to quote something that you that you said um, in 2018. And the title of the story was "The Family History DNA 
can't reveal. Um, and you said, for my mother's family, like all African American families, the question of where are you from is a complicated one, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's huge. To me, that definitely, that's the identity question. And that's where we are, mm -hmm. which makes your work so dope because it, it, it really taps into identity politics and, 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 and how, um, particularly people of color, how we are all navigating the world and, and sort of these identities that have been bestowed upon us. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, where are you from, right? That's, that can be taken in so many ways. Who am I? Mm -hmm. and, and it depends on what the world says I am in some ways. Um, and for people of color, um, who the world has said we are um, is a very complex one and a very painful one. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of your story, at the end of your, your narrative, you, you said this. What if we map the strengths passed down for the things that helped our ancestors survive in a hostile world. So you were taking the focus away from, from DNA. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that an echo of what we are looking for when we try to determine which tribe in West Africa we may have come from? Which kin group we might claim? Sometimes we're looking in our blood for a map from our ancestors when it has always been here in how we talk to and love one another. Um, <laughs> that, that, that quote, yes, you can clap for that. You can clap for that. It's good, it's good. It's good. And, um, and that, that is Toni Morrison. That Toni um, and so many others um, have struggled and wrestled with the question of love on a human level. But I have to say that that human, that universal human experience is very different, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I don't consider myself the same as, as a white person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to be clear about that. We may have some similarities, but my fears for my children are very different from a white person's fear for their children. My fears and hopes and dreams for my black son is very <coughs> different from the hopes and dreams of someone who is white. Right? It's very different. And so if you look beneath the surface in many ways, we, there, there's, there's a difference there. But there's also this, this, this thing called love. And when I read some of your work, I, there's, there's, a, there's the, the question of love. So I want you to speak to not only love on certain levels in your work creatively, um, but this, it is not a new term. I've started to use this more. And Darno Moore has started to use this, which I love, which is radical love. Mm -hmm. right. How do you show radical love in your creative work, in your processes, when you are sending a message? How do we as educators show radical love to our children? Because that's what we, that's what we need. Um, so if someone could take that very courageous and brave question <laughs> that I just asked, um, if you could explore the theme of love in your work, uh, I would greatly appreciate it. I might even forget that y'all are out there. This one, this one, this is a, a, my question. Sorry, I have to be so stingy and selfish up here. But that's a question for me because I struggle. I struggle with that uh, as a theme. Um, but I'd love to hear uh, what you have to say. And, and Dr. Amani, I want to get to you as well because your book really explores that on a on such a deep level. Um, so, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, the, it has, I mean, in, in the, the, the point is made beautifully by Caitlin, and it is made in everyone's work on the stage, um, that when you take seriously the history and lives of black people, that is an act of love. It's an act of love and defiance of white supremacist ideology every day. Um, it happens both in the work but also in the day-to-day -day commitments. Um, I think I have the distinction of being the one person on this panel who's given piggyback rides to everybody except me. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good piggyback <laughs> I'm and still I, waiting though. Yeah. Might have a long way. Um, and I, but I, I think for me that is actually
actually an example early on. I mean, so as a child, there is a very particular, and I loved being a part of this community, there's a particular kind of affection that I had from black girls who were younger than me. Right? Um, that was about understanding, um, even before it could be articulated by me in a sort of in a, in a sophisticated way, right? That I that we shared something, that we shared a particular kind of journey in the world, right? And so when I saw them, it made my heart sing, and I wanted to pick them up. Right? <laughs> um, and you know, I I, I mean, I, I I think that that's. And to be able to be honest about that affinity, I mean, one of the things, when I talk about the book, the most consistent thing that people have a, a problem with is one sentence, in which I say, I have taught my children not to love white people. The sentence immediately following it is, I'm not, of course I'm not talking about individuals. I love many individual white people. Um, but I'm talking about as a kind of, as a category that has meaning in this society, both historically and currently, that is based upon the exclusion mm -hmm. and the marginalization of other people. Mm -hmm. And so there's a distinction between the encounter, the intimate encounter with individuals, right, um, and the idea of whiteness, which I think, and I've taught my children not to love that because I want them to love themselves and who they are. And if you can't love both as a black person, you cannot love what whiteness means and love blackness. Um, and so, for me, there's a kind of, I mean, the radicalism is that we have a social order that is oriented around the refusal to acknowledge the complete humanity of black people, the love of black people, the embrace of black people, the genius of black people, right? And so it, it's radical because once you make the decision that you're going to commit fully to it, you have to be prepared for hostility at every turn. And I can assure you, even though we are in various ways celebrated on this panel. We have all experienced it multiple times. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And in fact, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I will just say, well, first of all, Amani was like, I, I always, when I came in today and I saw Amani standing there, I was like, oh, so I like, like went back to being like five in the kindergarten, <laughs> and she was like old and the cool, like fifth, sixth grader, and her running over and picking me up, and I was very tiny and I was very shy and these huge glasses, <laughs> <laughs> and her like running over and picking me up and being like 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 going like this, and so. But I think um, to echo what uh, you're saying, I think that one of the startling things for me has been as an educator and as a scholar is encountering people who and this isn't to say that my life is perfect or my childhood was perfect far from it um but people who were not brought up to love blackness yeah. just automatically right um is was something that it really was hard for me when i entered college and went out in the world and found out that that wasn't true mm -hmm. The good part about that, though, was that I never had a desire to have to see whiteness as the default. Um, I still don't see whiteness as a default. Um, and so what that did was that it makes it so that when you go out in the world, and even though, as Money's saying, on the stage we might be celebrated, but I know that all of us, you know, I, I had an incident last week where somebody at Tufts defaced our African American trail project with um, oh, wow. the N-word. Mm -hmm. And my colleague and I, who's also an African-American woman academic, was telling us that neither of us should be professors. Mm -hmm. um, what? And that why were we professors at, the, at, at top? So it became this big thing. But I think that what it does to be armed with embracing back blackness and growing up never thinking that whiteness is the default mm -hmm. and never thinking that whiteness is the norm um, is that something like that um, is more my my response is, well, what is that person's problem, rather than what is the problem with myself, right? Mm -hmm. Where, um, and so I would, I would say that if you're talking about anti-blackness, I would, I would push back a little bit on saying that it's about identity, because I think we like to talk about identity and identity politics without really looking at the fact that all politics is identity politics. That's Everybody right. participates in the world based on whatever identity it is that they have been told that they had. And so it's only used when you're talking about African American people engaging and questioning institutions of power. So I would hesitate to say that you know identity politics or politics or is it our identity? It's a way of being in the world and encountering um, the political systems and the economic systems in which you're interacting as opposed to identity. Um, and so, yeah, so I will leave it at that. <laughs> um, I've been, I have been thinking
thinking about this idea of radical love in my work lately, in the type of work that I put on stage. Uh, and I can be very specific. So um, recently I've been asked to um, work on a play that is very old. Uh, it's about hmm, 18, 20 years old. And um, so I've been asked to that you wrote. Th that I wrote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wrote. But, but I have liberty to rewrite it. I'm not taking too much support. Uh, and the end, um, well, I can give it away because we're all gonna pro we're all probably gonna be here and not um I just be this is live stream. So anyway, so an act of violence happens at the end of the play. Um, uh, involving um, a husband and wife who are uh, uh, black. And I thought to myself, do I want to perpetuate this violence between this black couple? What Do I want to have these images in this play? And um, given where we are in this cultural moment, I thought to myself, no, I don't. I don't want to do this. Uh, so I changed, I changed the ending. Um, and uh, uh, in service of trying to have an ending that, um, that celebrated um, radical love as opposed to extreme violence against these two black be beings on stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the other things that, one of the things that theater has the power to do is effect change. So we see these things on stage and they create catharsis within us, and hopefully, maybe, we, by seeing them, we, are in, uh, 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 we want to affect change within our own lives, or hopefully within the society which, within which we find ourselves. And um, uh, it wasn't the right ending. There's something about seeing that on stage, even though it is violent and horrible. So it really made, that sitting in this moment now, and I'm here right now artistically, so this is a very raw place for me to be and be sharing with all of you. Um, this moment where I'm realizing like, I, I theoretically, I am with, I'm with Imani and Carrie, <laughs> but artistically, I'm just like, we need that image so we can get, so I can get mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm in a whole, I'm like, oh, I want to be where you are. <laughs> I want to be where you are so much. But I'm, I'm in a different, I'm in a different place. And I had to then go and rewrite it and, and change any back um, so that we can sell that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, maybe, yeah. I don't know, this is a playwright, you don't know. You don't know. It really is, it sounds hokey and strange, mm -hmm. but you could only affect maybe two people in our audience, but maybe they're the right two people and they're going to lead us someplace really wonderful. Um, and those two people will lead us there. I don't okay. know. I hope so. Uh, but change it back. Yeah. That's where, I, that's where my hands are. Um, I have been thinking about it a lot in my work as well because the. Um, I've just been thinking a lot, of, a lot about it, about how to write uh, about love in a particular way. Um, and so I've been reading a lot about it. Um, I've, I've been teaching for the last couple semesters, I've been teaching a ghost stories class. So I teach a lot of Toni Morrison in that class because she has a ghost in every book. Yes. And, um, and so we read love in that class, um, in her novel. And she talks a lot um, when she talks about that novel about why she chose to call it love and uh, that a lot of her writing uses that word. Um, and in her own words, she talks about wanting to use that word and, and how you write using words like love or peace or heart, these words that she says come from parable that you're trying to use. Um, they, they are deceptively simple. Um, everybody has their own definition for them. And then they also have these larger cultural definitions um, that are not always uh, um, mean what we expect the word to mean. Um, in particular, when she talks about the word love, she talks about how oftentimes um, in our culture that word is actually describing a relationship of dominance, um, especially when we're talking about sort of romantic love or uh, heterosexual love or um, love within a family. Um, what we're really talking about is like a relationship where one person is submitting to another person or another person is is putting their will over another person. So if you're a writer, um, how do you use that word that may mean that to other people 
to mean something radical, um, something that can mean something, uh, uh, blow that notion up for a reader or confirm someone who hasn't felt love in that way, who actually has felt love as a liberation, um, how do we sort of write to, uh, to affirm those things? Um, and uh, in my own work, I'm still sort of trying to figure out how to do that and, um, and sort of like Kirsten was saying, how you both write scenes and work that is um, uh, emotionally true um, and reads emotionally true to your audience. Um, while also um, opening up these possibilities for another way to think about what those emotions could mean or how, or how people could enact those emotions. So I don't know how you do that yet. That's something that I'm working on right now, but yeah. Thank you, thank you. That was for me, y'all. That wasn't for y'all, that was for me. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's interesting. I, I wanna go to an article uh, September 12th of this year, um, 2019, um, and Amani, the title read, Why Amani Perry Doesn't Like Jane Austen Novels. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, and they, they really asked some, some great questions in that, in that piece, it was a short, uh, you know, very entertaining piece. But before I, before I, <laughs> before, I uh, before I get there, though, I, I want to define some terms that, that we use. One, um, white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? And I know that sometimes we, we're at different places, and I don't want to make any assumptions, but when we're talking about white supremacy, we're talking about an ideology, right? We're talking about what Audre Lorde talked about, which is presumptive dominance. Mm -hmm. So the forms in which white supremacy can show up um, and that's, that's really hard. I mean, I think storytelling is, is amazing in the work that you see uh, before you uh, that, that have been um, put on by these, by these uh, brilliant sisters up here, but that's very difficult to, to have that show up in your work or to talk about that um, in such a way that is not only compelling, but that also people understand what white supremacy is in all of its forms. Um, so I want to I want to put that out there, and then the term whiteness, um, which is sort of the unspoken um, language of, of of the perceived normal, right? And and that is anything else that is white is perceived as perceived as normal, and so it's the sort of the invisible language that that white people have of normality um, that also advantages them, right? Um, if I wore a, a, a sweatshirt or a hoodie, I would say up here, um, you know, I have to think about that as a black male because, because whiteness would dictate that I come with a pseudo, right? Or someone might not take me seriously. Um, and I've had that happen as well. So I just wanna kinda throw that out there and define those terms. I think sometimes we use white privilege, white supremacy, and whiteness interchangeably, um, and they have different meanings. Um, now, to get back to my question. Um, do you prefer books that reach you emotionally or intellectually, who do you most admire and respect? That was the question that was asked of you, Amani. Um, and your response, <laughs> ideally both. I think the best books unlatch something within and that requires both intellectual provocation and emotional disarming. That's what keeps me reading. And in terms of playwrights, I think she, she was asked, what's, what's, who's our favorite playwrights? Um, it was Lynn Knowledge that you mentioned. Um, and it was Kirsten Greenwich that was mentioned as well. Their voices are distinctive, but they both share Lorraine's gift, referencing Lorraine Hansberry, uh, for an extraordinary crafting of ideas and arguments through authentic personalities and language. Their work is masterful. Um, yes, yes. Uh, I'm telling you, I, I, I mean, for someone who can pick the right words at the right time, I mean, I was like throwing my fist up in the air. I was like, yeah, you know, I, I wanted to say that, but but you said it. Um, and I want you to speak to to that 
specifically, um, why you chose those specific writers, and, and hopefully, you know, you can talk a little bit, and we can sort of go through that uh, down the list, why, why that's so. Yeah. I mean, um, and that's a compelling argument. Um, but I also want you to talk about Lorraine Hansberry, um, who is not often written about. Um, uh, and you really took on a very brave um, biography slash memoir. I mean, it, it was very insightful, it was powerful. I switched my eighth grade reading list. We put Lorraine on the, on the reading list um, because I saw her in a very different way, in a very complex way. Um, so if you could speak yeah, to that part and sure. to speak to um, why you gave a shout out to your sister in the New York Yeah, Times. Mm -hmm. I mean, right, so who used to, I used to play, play sister with. <laughs> um, but, and oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm, a play that engages with Erasing the Sun. Luck of the Irish. Luck of the Irish, my God. Yes. So, yeah. yes, yes. yes. I mean, so let me say it this way. So I think that Erasing the Sun is an extraordinary play. Um, it's, it, it demonstrates kind of mastery of the ensemble form. What the Luck of the Irish did in addition to that, and I, will, I wanna say this, and it, I don't care that it's being recorded, it was a real failure to say that Clybourne Park was the re-engagement re with, with um, with raisins, it was luck of the Irish. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that you, because you emotionally engage with the white characters in a way that um, is not, it's not an apologia, but it's a, an honest, sensitive treatment of people's motivations and desires and resentments and aspirations, right? And that's what moves you, right? So that there's both the argument, right, about property and race and generations, and just, which is, you know, in some ways it kind of it's echo in another generation. Um, but then there's real people, right? And so to me, I mean, one of the things I think is always the aspiration for a creative intellectual. I mean, sometimes the distinctions between artist and intellectual are drawn too, too hard, right? is that you want to make people think and make people feel, right? Um, and so that's really what I, um, what I was talking about. I just wanna go back to the point about, about white supremacy for a moment though, because to be completely honest, um, the response to the Jane Austen quote struck me as having a lot to do with whiteness. <laughs> because, um, and I noticed, you know, and there were European writers who I talked about in the piece, but it was almost as though because she's a figure who is in the American Academy and high school, is, is, is seen as sort of a signature figure of literary excellence. And so I had someone wrote a letter to the Times after the interview saying, as someone who's supposed to be a professor, right, how dare you, right, not like Jane Austen. And I literally, I, I just don't like to read the, like, so it's that the, the taste has to have, and we, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of research on the ideas of taste as being deeply embedded in sort of ideologies around race, right? So this idea that there's a failure because my taste is distinct and there's a question about my legitimacy as an intellectual and a scholar because my taste is not, I don't, I'm not interested in parlor conversation, I'm just not. Right? I love Moby Dick, yeah. right? I love, you know, take me to the whaling ship, right? Um, but I don't care about the parlor and who, who she's gonna marry. It's not interesting to me. Um, but so, so this question, I think, you know, there's, there is a question about the idea of the production of art that is, and I think it goes back to the point, I mean, the point made earlier is that there is an intervention, even when it is not a kind of like, it's not self-consciously an intervention, but simply insisting upon a creative landscape that's distinct from what is conventional, has a kind of um, intervention that you can sometimes um, witness by virtue of the backlash against it, right? And even simply, I mean, I think even the fact of, for me, pointing to works that were done in translation was just, 
you know, that were not sort of, that were not Anglophone was a problem part of it too. Like not, so it's not even just a question of race, but the idea of a kind of we, right? What it, it means to be um, an American intellectual. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to go in a minute. <laughs> I have to catch a It's, it's 7.21. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll 30 minutes, yeah. Um, my, my next question is for actually for, uh, for, for Carrie, because um, you, you spoke to the historical um, a little bit. And um, I'm teaching an eighth grade humanities class. It's going OK, y'all. <laughs> We're making it. Um, and you know, we have an anti-bias curriculum, and, and history is really, really important. And I come from a critical race theory background, right? That race is, is endemic and it is permanent. Um, and we have to consider that when we walk into the classroom with our kids. And, I, and this is for everybody, because everyone up here is an educator, um, um, both in the classroom space, whether you're mentoring, whether you're coaching, you are educating, um, and, and, and I call it transferring. That's what we, we're starting to use this term at CFS, which is transformational education, where we are transferring information, um, and we see that information as a political document. Um, and, I, and I've started with looking at, at, the, at the globe. I've started to look at Africa um, and the continent of, continent of Africa and understanding what the European powers did to Africa. Um, and I, because I believe that they cannot, that kids cannot understand racism um, on a fundamental level without understanding the geopolitical landscape uh, in which the European powers really, um, um, and still today, has taken away from Africa. Can you speak to why history is so important um, for, for students um, in the transference of power and information and, 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 and helping them to understand racism, you know, in our world. Um, f can you speak to that as, as an historian as to why that is important for them to have the truth and to be able to be familiar with the stories that, that come out of that? I know that's a very multi-layered question, but. Um, I, I would just say that um, I am, as a historian, I am, I am often baffled by the fact that people have whatever conversation they're having, they have this perception if they don't know history that it's the first time they're having this conversation. Um, and if you have, <laughs> if you have a history, if you're a historian, you realize that you're, it's it's not as if where we are is new. It's not as if the, as if the conversation you're ha we're having at the moment is new, particularly when you're having conversations about race, although it might be a new for the period in which you're in. Right, and so you have to make the distinction between the fact that what you're what you're talking about the issues isn't new, right? Um, but the the context in which you're talking about them are, are new. I would say that history should be you're you're making me get on my soapbox, but history should be taught in everything that students have. Right? It should be taught in math. It should be taught in science. It should be taught in English. It should be taught in music class. It should be taught in everything, right? Because once you have that grounding it then makes all of these terms that we use to talk about race and racism and inequity, it makes it so that that's just part of the conversation and the way that people understand that the world functions. So that by the time somebody turns 18, and I see them in college, they're not shocked by um, certain things that happen. They're still 18, and so they still are, you know, everyone's 18 and you have a reaction, but it's, it's a different type of reaction. I was talking to, um, uh, Chris Hoey, is he here? Oh, there you are, yes. Who was a uh, wonderful second grade teacher here for many years, and his curriculum, and the curriculum that he and Aaron do in the second grade is this, um, I get it wrong every time, C to shirt. And it's basically all it is all year is the students learn how slavery produced the Industrial Revolution. And the fact that at the end of the year, all those second graders, including my niece and nephew, can give you in a second grade, I mean, it's in a second grade term, but they can basically say, they're already armed with this idea that um, the Industrial Revolution didn't just happen and black people are incidental to it, right. or slavery is incidental to American history, is that that becomes a part of the curriculum. And so my comment would be that I, it, the, the reason why history is important is because once that becomes just the, this, just the fact, right? the historical basis, a lot of the conversations 
that people have now can be done on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Because it's as if we're having the same conversation over and over again, mm -hmm. even though it's a different context, uh, but we're, it's, it's just the same conversation. Um, one of the things um, that um, irks me to no end is the fact that many teachers not being taught on how you teach history, and the fact that you can have students read very complicated texts. And yes, they might not. Oh no, you're leaving. Dr. Mary Curry, y'all. She came, she conquered. Yeah. And she was, uh, <laughs> Typical black of an academic. <laughs> But wonderful. I love that. Anyway, but uh, but what I would say is that you know at, you know history is the basis for everything, and the and the sooner that we start to realize that, the better. And the sooner we realize that children, a complicated text, you know, you can teach it to kids. Reading texts and having <laughs> to not understand it at the first time is fine, right? Um, coming back to it when you're it, from seventh grade and then reading again in ninth grade is the way you learn stuff. And so I think too many people have this perception that somehow like history has to be like in a stage. It has to be taught in like third grade, seventh grade, tenth grade, and then twelfth grade, right? And not realizing that it's something that is it should be part of the curriculum and taught. Um, and if we had that approach to history, I think that a lot of the conversations we have, particularly surrounding race and inequity and class, um, we would be able to have it at a higher level as opposed to just having the same um, sophomore conversation about you know what race is, right? If people kind of had a, had a historical grounding and everything. I would just add that on my part, when, when I get students, I often see the flip side of that, which is, um, you know, I'm, I'm teach cre I teach writing and um, for people doing creative writing is often the idea that their experience is the first time that anybody has ever felt these things. Um, and, you know, if, if people had this grounding in history, um, our literature would be so wonderful. <laughs> um, because you would, you would realize um, you aren't the first person to feel this feeling of alienation or this anger or this loss or this grief. Um, people have felt it before. Um, people have lived your, partic your particularity before and written from that before. Um, and in fact, your writing can become richer if you read those people. Um, so, uh, you know, building off of what Imani was sort of saying, um, you know, Jane Austen is great, you know, but um, if, you, if that is all that you've read, you, you are going to believe that perhaps you're the first person ever to write about what it feels like to be X. Um, whereas if we sort of have the history and those um, narratives already in our curriculum, you would know that you're not the first and you can actually be in conversation with those people and, and hopefully get to a place where you're saying something new. Um, um, and since we're on the topic of, of education, I want to continue down that vein because, again, all of you are also educators, and um, I want you to talk about what is important to you about being both educators and artists, um, and what do you hope to teach um, subsequent gen generations uh, about that, that that particular concept? You know, and that's. You know that's 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 tough. Um, even teaching eighth graders, I, I want to teach writing, um, but I also want to teach as a writer, and for them to read literature as as writers. Um, so if you could speak to to that that dynamic of, of art, artistry and and education at the same at the same time, or being an artist and an educator at the same time. Um, well, for me, personally, it's a really selfish thing in that um, when you're a writer, you spend a lot of time alone. So teaching um, and working with other writers is a way to sort of break up that um, sort of occupational hazard of spending most of your day just in your own head sort of writing stuff. Um, but then also, I think it's important for students to see um, working artists to understand uh, that being an artist is separate from and can exist outside of 
um, how we sort of understand career tracks and sort of generally uh, making money. Um, I, I, it's sort of two ways. I think it's good for um, students to see, a working artist to see the, all the different ways that artists organize their lives in order to be able to do their art. And then I also think it's important to understand that um, uh, creating art and learning about how art is created it can exist outside of um, this sort of results-oriented idea that we usually have, that is, has creeped into all of our lives, that has creeped into how we um, educate our kids, has crept into how we um, sort of think about how we order our time, um, and uh, that there is a pursuit or a way of going through life or a way of making things that can exist that is outside of that, that has nothing to do with how much that thing is going to be valued or what you can sell it for or um, uh, even sort of um, whether or not more than maybe t 10 people are going to find value in it, that you can make something that exists sort of outside of that um, demand uh, is, I think, increasingly more important, especially with, I think, uh, people coming up in this generation and the generation after, um, there's uh, sort of, because of social media, because of the internet, because of all of the different ways that you can create now and all the different platforms that things can go out into the world in, um, there can be an enormous pressure that what you're creating should immediately, um, you know, have 10,000 eyes on it um, and engage with everybody. And I think if you have a, an artist as an educator, an artist as a teacher in your school, um, you can begin to sort of push back against that and um, that opens up the arts and the idea of creation to so many more kids who maybe just want to make something for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what um, for playwrights, so playwriting is a strange, this is, it's a pretty odd uh, occupation <laughs> in that uh, plays are definitely written. We, I'm a, I am a writer, I consider myself a writer, but plays are also wrought, so it's a craft. Um, and uh, in order to perpetuate the craft of playwriting, you learn from others who come before you. And so in that sense, um, it is really important uh, to my mind to pass on um, any bit of knowledge that I may have some days I think it's nothing at all um, because I'm a writer and that's my uh, uh, purview. But in other times, um, it, because it's just I've been around for a while, it is it can be a lot to the generation that um, is coming up, generations that are coming up after me. Um, uh, some of us playwrights are theater people or artists. Some of us maybe aren't that great at educate, being educating and maybe we should step aside. But a lot of us do have a lot of knowledge to share and it's our, it is our responsibility to teach those coming up after us um, because the art, um, the discipline will die out if we don't teach those coming up after us. Um, so those who can are able to teach, that is what we should be doing. Um, that doesn't mean that you do it to the point where you can no longer do your own work. Um, and that doesn't mean that you spend 30 years doing it if you don't have the capacity. But many of us do have, um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes we give too much and we burn ourselves out. That's not what I'm talking about. But um, sometimes there is the ability to teach a workshop here or to write an article that might be disseminated uh, widely. That type of teaching is really important um, to make sure that uh, we are passing the torch and creating responsible theater artists uh, down the line. And which can lend itself to some of these questions of everyone thinking that they're inventing something new when perhaps there is scholarship, there is, um, there is literature to help those uh, coming up after us. Mm -hmm. Teacher Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Teacher Carrie. Oh, I would, I would just add that one of the things that I, I, talk, I look, tell my students is that being a historian is a craft. Um, just liking history is not, it doesn't make you a historian. Um, you have to be able to look at primary source documents um, and be creative, particularly when you're dealing with African descended people on what a primary source document is, um, and be able to decipher it that way and then come to um, a statement, a conclusion, an idea based on the primary source and on the literature that's been written before. And once you have students kind of get those two things down, so that you have to read a primary source, and then you have to see what other people have said about your source. If nobody's ever said anything about it before, then that's where you're, you, you still have to respond to what people haven't said. 
Um, once you get into that, I think that that's a very powerful way to teach um, students to have skills that are very valuable, even if you aren't don't end up becoming a historian or getting a PhD in history, which is that you're looking and you're deciphering what a fact or what a document is, right? At its very base level, um, and then you're you're looking at sort of what other people have analyzed about it. Um, I will say that I think that teaching. Um, is something that, as an academic, um, I enjoy doing because it requires me very selfishly to really break down what it is that I'm trying to say, as opposed to being in the space of um, being a historian, <laughs> which can also be that you sort of go down these rabbit holes and you assume that it's just sort of what you believe and what you know is fact, right? Uh, and it is fact, but you know, being able to break that down. Um, um, in a, at a very sort of base level, I think is a valuable skill to have. And being able to teach that to students, I think, can transfer into multiple things besides just being a historian. It can transfer into, you know, science, you know. Um, if you're having problems with something, you know, research it. That doesn't mean you Google it and try to figure it out. It means you actually go and research it, you know, with primary source material, right, and then use the material that you read. So I, um, I think that, Teaching and being an academic and practicing the craft of writing history, I think all of those things um, make me and make most scholars a better historian if you sort of are engaging with how people actually learn about history. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Yeah. I think what's also really important too, aside from, uh, in addition to teaching, is mentorship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when, as we talk about anti-blackness and forces of anti-blackness, but and particularly for artists of color and black artists, is having mentors. So uh, uh, people who you can call upon, even if it's not every day, maybe it's once a year, maybe it's once every five years, um, but people who have come before you, who you can call on, um, or who you feel you can call on, who have come before. Uh, because I think in all of our professions, um, it can be challenging to be a writer of color, a uh, pr professor of color, a historian of color, playwright of color, what, whatever your other is, <laughs> it can be challenging. And so there is the teaching, and then there is the mentorship. And so um, I think each one of us has had mentors of some kind. And then I think, uh, mm -hmm as I out, all of us are getting older, um, uh, our, the wheels turn and are now are able to serve as mentors for other people as well. Yeah. <laughs> and now that I have the Green Edge sisters here to myself, I can really talk about what it was like growing up. And I, I, I wanna, and I want to frame the question a little bit because that's that's where I want to I want to go because I'm sure that growing up you've had um, certain influences. I mean, even looking at Amani's work um, and looking at um, Lorraine Hansberry, her growing up in Chicago, being pre sort of a, a, the product of a working class family, and the impact that that had on her and her work, and and how she creates authentic voices and characters in her work. Um, so, uh, if you could give me, um, you know, specific instances, um, not only in your educational experiences that have had a great influence, influence on you, but uh, what was it like uh, growing up, and what, what were you influenced by? And that's a, it's a two-part question, because I want to come back to the last part of this question, and I want you to speak also to your creative process now or your process now in getting work done. And I think everyone um, has a process. Um, and I, 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 used to, I used to be a journalist um, many years ago and I worked for a magazine called Black Issues Book Review. I don't know if, you, if anyone remembers that, that book review. It was a really popular book review out of, out of New York. Uh, and I, you know, I had a, a managing editor who was a mentor mm -hmm. and said, why don't you tag along with us and, and, and ride this out and write some pieces for us. And I got to experience so many different people and spend time with them. Um, you know, Walter Mosley, who in the morning, um, before he writes, uh, he has to have breakfast, 
Can't write without breakfast, right? Breakfast a champion. Me too. And then he starts to read um, the encyclopedia. So that, that, that is the start of his process. He cannot do it with, without that. Um, Nikki Giovanni has to write around books, um, have a great relationship with, with, with Nikki, and, um, and reading is so fundamental to the start of her process as, as a writer. Um, and, she, and she told me, I told her, I said, you know, I want to write just like you, Nikki. And she said, well, you got to read, Jack. You got to read. <laughs> um, you know, real, real, you know, in your face. That's the way Nikki, Nikki was. Um, you know, I had an awesome opportunity to host uh, Maya Angelou, who, who stays, everybody knows this about Maya, who she, she refuses to stay. If it's not a five-star hotel, um, she won't stay there for particular reasons. And she has to stay there with a Bible. She has to have a Bible and, and a glass of water, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so there's prayer, there's meditation, and there's something about the ambiance of a hotel. And it's not like more of a, people thought it was a status thing, like a diva thing. You know, we, you, you buy a stand in a hotel, it's a five-star restaurant, you can't, you know, five-star hotel, you can't, she can't stay there unless, and, and it's not that, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the way in which the room is spaced and created in a five-star hotel that's very different from um, maybe uh, the Romana Inn, right? Um, um, so I, I want you to speak to uh, not only what influenced you, but, but what is your process of producing such great work? And I'm sorry to say that's a question for me too, because the work that I've seen coming from all of you is fantastic work. It is thoughtful work. Um, and there has to be a process to get to that level. And if you could explain that in less than a couple of minutes, <laughs> I think um, I think we might we might be on the money here. Uh, and I'm taking notes, by the way. I've got a pen. Um, Karen, you want to start? Caitlin, you want to start? Or um, sure, I'll be really quick. For me, um, I don't I don't really need a like a set place to write or anything. Um, I'm usually writing in between sort of traveling to other places or, um, uh, uh, so for nonfiction stuff, usually it starts with uh, a question um, that usually comes from reading uh, essays or just sort of general uh, opinion pieces around a particular issue or question and looking for the parts of the conversation where it feels like there are gaps or where there's been sort of an angle <coughs> left out. Um, and then sort of um, following that question towards where where it might lead. Um, and uh, for writing fiction, so far it's sort of been looking at um, different uh, historical stories or notes or sort of footnotes um, that are really sort of fascinating and interesting that don't get uh, a sort of like a, a larger meditation because they're so odd and so, because they don't really fit into um, a larger historical narrative or because they are about uh, people or places that are not necessarily um, triumphant but are um, containing sort of some other emotion. Uh, and so those are sort of the things that drive me in the fiction side. Um, and uh, process, I try not to be too particular about process because um, sort of like life happens very quickly and, um, and so I try to be as flexible as possible. Um, I try not to get caught up on, uh, you must sort of write every day or you must um, do, do sort of like X things. Um, I try to recognize that as much writing happens sort of on the rumination and thinking about something as actually sort of sitting down and writing. Um, and especially for the nonfiction stuff, I usually write most, a, a lot of it or, or paragraphs of it in my head first sort of over and over again um, and then start to write it down and then um, start figuring out how to structure it. Um, and sort of write it on the fly, email a lot of stuff to myself, um, sort of as I'm going about my day. 
Um, let's see. Um, I'll start with the process. So it used to be that I got, I think I was a little bit more precious about stuff, even though I don't think it wasn't like I needed a, a desk and, or flowers or anything like that. And then I, um, life got a lot busier. I have kids um, and my days got filled up in a much different way. And I learned a lot from watching uh, um, my daughter at gymnastics and her, her team going to gymnastics uh, competitions where sometimes, and, and shows where I would, you know, these were really teeny little kids and sometimes like their warm-up area would be kind of crazy and um, I'd just be like, how are they gonna, I would get all crazy, like, how are they gonna warm up, what's gonna happen? And they just <laughs> do the warm-up and like go do the routine. And, um, and it seems like it's coming very late in my writing life to, to think about this, but I was like, oh yeah, they just, they just get, their, get their SHIT done and do it. And um, that was- I'm glad you spelled that. <laughs> <laughs> um, they just get their, you know, they just do it. And that was very helpful to me, especially, and I think it was coming right at the right time when, um, uh, you know, I, I, I teach, so I oversee playwriting at BU, and so I have a lot of students handing me their work, so I'm constantly teaching at a, a very high volume all the time, um, uh, and I have to constantly um, segment my day in ways that to get the writing done, it's not like during the school year, it's not long, luxurious amounts of time that people think a writer has. Um, you know, that meme, like, this is what the people think the writer's life is like. It's not like that at all. I, I wish one day it will be like that, but right now it's not for most of my uh, uh, school year. So it's just, you have, I have an hour to do it, you get it done. Um, I used to not need things like complete quiet. I have, it has to be quiet, it's even fans. So like right now there's a hum in this room that would not, I, despite my just get it done, it's like just get it done in a quieter place. <laughs> um, uh, there are certain things I do need to do before I can write. And this might be a little bit of PTSD from 9-11 is I have to check the news. Like I kind of have to just be like, is there, are we all, I know we're not cool, okay? <laughs> I know the world's not cool. <laughs> But I need to make sure we're semi-cool enough for me to be able to turn the, the phone like this um, to be able to write. Uh, one thing that's really, I, I find I get super distracted. So I, I find modern life really difficult in terms of there's really, it's very difficult to not have things dinging all the time. Phones ding, um, go, I hate, I, I, I hope no one here works for Google or works, wherever this is going. Do not come after me, because people do come after you all the time when you write. Um, is that the way that all, all, all our stuff, you get, it's almost impossible to turn everything off. And I do need everything to be turned off. And a lot of that is, um, I don't know what it's like to write fiction. I was really bad at writing fiction, so and, um, I was really bad at writing okay. history. I was a history major. It wasn't until Caitlin went to the same college and she was a history major and she started winning history awards and all of our same professors were so into her. I was like, what? But there's, there's with playwriting especially, there, and I write ensemble driven pieces most of the time. I've got like, you know, eight different voices in my head, plus the stage directions, um, and plus my uber voice of playwright, and I, I just cannot have all this mm -hmm. other stuff going on in my head all at once. And I'm usually working on four or five pieces at once. So, um, I just, it has to be quiet. That's part of it. <laughs> um, uh, the only thing I will open the, answer the day for is if it's not my kids. Um, so therefore, it does have to be on a little bit. So that's, that's fair. Uh, in terms of influences, so both my sisters are brilliant and read much loftier things than I do. I, I am like a sewer. Anything that comes down the pipe, I'm like, I don't need that. This is trash. Um, <laughs> I'll take anything. So I'm not even going to reveal what's on my desk. Um, except for Amani's book is on my desk. Yeah. It's bad. I will reveal. Um, 
<laughs> Amen. They are going to be there, although she will, uh, theoretically, she holds a special place in my heart, and um, I, I have a podcast of, about her on my phone, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, we did, Amani and Carrie and I were just talking about this. In terms of growing up, we watched an incredible amount of television yeah. oh, and inappropriate television. Like an incredible <laughs> amount. There were times when we were uh, when we were told not to watch it, and we obeyed those times. So what I mean, like <laughs> screen time was different. It wasn't constant the way it is now. So it's different. We were like four channels. Was, yeah, yeah. But we did cable. We did um, just watch a lot. Of but we watched a lot. <laughs> I'm glad my daughter's not up in here. <laughs> <laughs> the difference, yeah, but the di the difference was that there we would voluntarily then turn it off and then spend hours acting it out, hours yeah. writing like news stories about it, hours <laughs> our radio programs. Came we in. had radio <laughs> programs, but like we that I think that was the difference in terms of like our what we were then doing with the content was just a little different. Um, whereas sometimes when I'll try and get my kids to do it, I'll be like, let's do a radio show. And my kids are like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you do the radio show. Um, we would like to watch some YouTube. <laughs> okay, I've taken a break. Um, process. I would say that I, um, since I was very small, I read all the time. Um, and now I've been, my favorite thing is Audible. I'm not a very technologically savvy, um, as my sisters can attest to. But the one thing I do is Audible, so I listen to um, books on Audible as I drive because I live far out. Um, but I try to read two books in a week because I like to be able to um, get them, like make an outline of it in my head. It's very bizarre. Um, but so like uh, Volker Ulrich came out with a wonderful biography of Hitler and kids, the kids, my niece and nephew kept on telling me, why is that Hitler book all over the place? Like it's in his house because I was determined to finish it in a week. Um, so there's, there's stuff like that. I try to do that just because I can be very anal retentive. So I like to be able to say that I've read a week work of nonfiction history and a work of fiction in one week and then move on to the next thing. Um, and I'm pr pretty um, adamant about that just on my, my, own, weird, my own weird thing. Um, but in terms of writing, I think it, maybe it's because I'm the middle child, I need noise um, around me, and I need noise that is not talking to me, but that is like a cacophony around me. So I write a lot in coffee shops and places, because I actually, it makes me get more done when I don't know what people are talking about, but I can just hear them talking. Um, and so I spend a lot of time in coffee shops. I, spend, I also, if it's not a coffee shop, I need to have music um, on in some way in order to write. But um, I don't know, as Chris was saying, we grew up watching a lot of TV. We also grew up reading a lot. Um, and I think in terms of influences, I think one of the things um, was that I always grew up hearing people in my family tell stories, um, whether it was like stories about their life or just the way people would tell stories about they went to the store and this happened. Um, and always just having that noise of stories in the background, I think was um, uh, very effective. In terms of influences, I will say, um, that I had really, really good, I was talking to, about this to somebody, that as much as I was filled with angst in junior high and high school, I had very good um, teachers who would just give me stuff to read um, and give me stuff to do. And when I was like in 10th grade, I tried to, I got mad at the history curriculum and I rewrote it because they weren't covering <laughs> um, And that history, they tried to kick me out of the school, I went to a private school and stuff, like horrible, they had like all this meeting, my mother came in, my poor mother's like a single mother, she had to come in and like sit down, and they're like, you know, she's tried to redesign this curriculum. Um, <laughs> so I'm not But the good part was, is I was fortunate enough to have teachers who then, that history teacher, until I graduated from high school, just would send me these history books and send me the column. You still had to cut things out, so there was no Google. would cut out articles from like the Atlantic or from uh, the American Historical Review and just put them in my mailbox and be like, well, read these things. So I think that that's been, I think that, um, you know, people say, you know, if they ever for the grace of God go I, if I had been probably in any other environment, I would have been, you know, kicked out of school and, you know, don't read this thing and what are you doing? But I think I was very fortunate of having people who, 
Uh, probably didn't like me very much as a person <laughs> because I was a little obnoxious as like a teenager, but probably were like, okay, just give the, the, like I see this article, just put it in your mailbox and I would, I would need it. So I think, you know, I tell my students you have to read stuff, even stuff that you don't particularly um, think that you like, um, and even stuff that, um, history, I always try to read a history book that's not in my field, um, so that I kind of get, just grasp what um, other historians are, saving, are, are, are talking about, you know, um, I read a great history of Australia recently um, that was just, well, you know, the straight like history of Australia, because I don't, who, would, how, who is like an oceanist who studies this stuff? Um, so yeah, but I think, I, think our, I think our childhood was very much um, a lot of TV watching, a lot of music watching. Kirsten is being very modest, she would make us do plays <laughs> from the time we were very, very tiny. Um, and organize everybody in the house and in the neighborhood, and charge people who came over. For <laughs> um, and my mother would be like, "You can't charge people money to come to our house," you know that type of stuff. But I mean, it, but it was. I think that one of the things was we were given that space, even though my mother would say, "Okay, you have a half hour to do a play," because it could go on for long. And she'd be like, "Okay, you have a half hour. We have forty minutes to do this play, and then you know, everyone's going to leave and talk adult stuff." But I think I uh, a time limit. there was always a time limit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so I mean, I mean, but uh, I don't know. I think I think, but it's a different age now. You're talking. I was talking about this with Imani that yeah, who has kids and Kirsten has kids and Caitlin has a, a new baby. I think that it's a different um, world now, where I think it's so. And I don't have any children, but I just see it like kids. You can't just put your kids outside to play most of the time. You can't just you know uh, say, okay, you watch TV, turn it off at four. Um, go to so and so's house and then come back by six. Like that's just not the world. We don't live in that same thing. So I think it's much harder now um, to cultivate that, or you have to try to cultivate it in a different way because there's it's just a different environment. And could you speak for one minute about your experience here as a CFS student and how that contributed to you? your your work there and how that may have influenced your your work now or who you are now? As creative people. I know that I um, I thought of myself as a writer very early on mm -hmm. and when I was here I can remember and I think I I think I got very interested in form looking back very early on and um, I can remember in third grade my teacher was Debbie um, I was right there. <laughs> and um, I decided I decided that I wanted to um, create my paragraphs and I wanted to indent the in, in, oh. invert the indentation. <laughs> and I, that, the way you would see it, it was, was printed in a book. And um, and that's the way that I wanted to do it. And Debbie, looking back now, Debbie was, it was ingenious and very kind and allowed me to do that for as long as I wanted. Um, uh, and what it did was it empowered me to think of myself as a writer um, and have ownership over the work uh, as opposed to saying, <laughs> um, uh, no, you're not a writer. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Um, she did say, actually, this is how you construct a paragraph. This is how a paragraph <laughs> might look on, looks on the page. So she did teach me how to do it. Um, and I remember, I do remember the, the I think a few sessions, like go, having one-on-one -on -one sessions and, and, and wanting to do it a certain way and Debbie showing me how to do it. But being very respectful that, you know, this is, you can do it this way. This is the actual way. Um, and eventually, you know, obviously, eventually I learned how to construct, to write a paragraph. Um, uh, but it was very empowering that I had own, I had agency over my own work, and I, I in my head it went on for like six months. I really think it probably went on for like a, just a week. <laughs> um, but that was that that was very powerful because I had spent two years in a different school where that I would have been shamed for doing that. I, and I think I was also, te I think I was probably also testing to see like, can I get away with this? Because I think I had thought of myself as a writer from what, since I was like two, and that I would have been, it would have been, I would have been shamed and chastised and told like this, under no circumstances are you a creative person, a writer, and this is horrible. Um, and it, it worked out. 
Yeah. So that that I remember um, being very very positive. Here. And then there are I, there are other teachers here who um, just affirmed um, that part of me from very very early on. Um, uh, I was also not always that strong in math. Uh, and uh, but I had a teacher named Erica who thought of us all as that we could all do the work. Um, they're all problem solvers. Yeah, they're all problem solvers. So um, that was also very powerful too. So the the teachers that I encountered here saw us and viewed us as thinkers and learners and affirmed us, saw the light in us, and treated us that way. And that was really powerful here. Yeah. Um, if you could say that one more time and look at that camera. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will, I will say just, um, I went here from kindergarten through fourth grade. I was very, very shy. Like I didn't talk to anybody. I had one little best friend that maybe used to hold hands um, and walk through Cambridge Friends. I was very, very shy, very quiet. Um, and one of the things I remember going here was just, she's not here anymore, but my teacher in kindergarten, first and second grade was named Lynette. Uh, and she yes. was just, oh, yeah. so I she, remember Lynette. Yeah, she used to just give me stuff to read. And it could be anything. It could even be from, you know, the third grade classroom or the fifth grade classroom. And she'd let me go down to the library and just, if it wasn't, if other people were reading something else, she'd have me read that thing, but then she'd just let me read whatever it was that I wanted to read. Um, also the encouraging with writing. I remember being very, um, <laughs> insistent um, that a paragraph was um, thesis, synthesis, and antithesis, because I had to that, and that, that's what you had to do. Um, and my teachers, all of my teachers, Lynette, and then my third, fourth teacher was named Helen McElroy. And she, oh, dear Helen. Yeah, she used to just let me, she was like, okay, you can do that, but you can also be more creative with the thing. I had like, there was like a phase where I, I thought that that's what, how you had to structure things. And she's saying, yes, that is, but you can also kind of be more creative with it. So I think my experience was that having, as person saying, teachers who um, sort of took you where you were um, and pushed you, but also saw you as someone who was learning things and was experimenting with things, as opposed to um, you're somebody who we have to get to do this task mm -hmm. because by the end of the year you have to know this task, right? Um, even though by the end of the year you didn't know those things, but it was it was the, the emphasis was on something um, completely different. Um, and then as leaving Cambridge Friends School and going to another school, which was a, uh, considered one of the best public schools in the state of Massachusetts, I won't say which one, um, which was horrible. I remember being completely shocked that you know teachers would shame you because you you know, didn't get a certain, you know, they had told you to write in this line and you went slightly over and everything just being very, very, very regimented. Um, and that being really difficult um, just because I didn't, I didn't um, understand why learning was made so miserable. Like I, I remember like, not understanding why that was something that was, this is supposed to be fun, but then it's, it's miserable. Like why are you making, making these leaving not fun? <laughs> um, um, so that was difficult. So um, I would say, yeah, just the, just the um, learning to love. It sounds very hokey and it sounds like, it seems like we're like being paid to like, you know, like run, get on the bandwagon. But I would, I would say, you know, it, it's, it's a powerful thing that, you know, learning to love learning being able to learn to love writing and like liking those things in, in terms of experimenting and realizing that you know what you learn in first grade might change by the time you get to second grade, might change by the time you get to fourth grade. So all right. You know, I, I usually end on a on a high note, um, but I I, I do want to end uh, with a provocative question. Um, oh I was just oh, okay. curious. How, like, what drew your parents to enroll you here? Um, I, I, Carrie was very shy, and so, it was very sickly, so I had, I have a, um, um, what? Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to tear it all down. <laughs> but I was very sickly as a child, um, and this was like the early 80s, and no school would agree to give me the medicines I needed during the day. Uh, because they said that they didn't want to be liable. So my mother took me to the public school in our town, and the woman, um, my mother can correct me if I'm wrong, but the woman said two things. First, she said that Kirsten shouldn't become 
a scholar or something like why didn't Kirsten just get married um, as a young girl and um, and and the, the second thing was that the teacher said um, in this town we lived in you know that um, I didn't really need medicines that they didn't need to give them to me why couldn't someone just come in and take me out of school if I needed medicine so I think that that was probably the impetus that my mother was looking for different options because um, she had to look for different options um, but yeah. the the the, the uh... It was during a school tour, and my mom asked, "What do you? What do the young women do when they graduate from high school? What's the trajectory?" And the answer was, um, uh, uh, the person giving the tour, the principal, was talking about what all the young men did, young boys did, and um, my mom asked what the young girls did, and the answer was, she hoped that they would be at home helping their moms. Oh yes. Ooh. So. Um, oh. Oh. My mom was a little bit worried. <laughs> so she, my mom, chose uh, Cambridge Friends for Carrie, and she chose a different um, uh, uh, private school um, that would offer aid for me. And then I came along to this interview. Um, Just there. I was wearing an eccentric outfit <laughs> that accepted my creativity, Carrie. <laughs> it was not real clothes. It was tights and I um, just talked and I talked a lot. <laughs> and they offered an um, application for me. <laughs> that is how I ended up here. <laughs> Luke during the, uh, I don't, my mom didn't have a babysitter for me for that interview for Kelly's interview. How many do you want to reflect on your experience? I think the time you came to school. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were here for a short time. I don't nope. know why I thought that. No. Okay. no. Where did you go? Um, I went to public school up until. Uh, seventh grade and then um i went to bbn for uh middle school and then to commonwealth for high school nice. and, and many of our kids go to commonwealth mm -hmm. and how, how was that for you at bbn commonwealth um commonwealth was interesting um i think it was probably the best place for me to go at the time um and it was definitely a place where I got a excellent education. Um, yeah. <laughs> so sweet. I like that. I like that. Um, I want. Did anyone have any? Do we have any audience questions before I ask the last sort of provocative yeah. question? Yeah. you asked a question and then you ran right over it, so they never really had to answer. Which what was it like? What was it like, you guys? Growing up, but I guess they're happy. Oh, happy. Growing up just in general? Well, I don't know what he said, but he didn't hear all these stories. But we got them. Yeah, we got them. Another question. When we were here to discuss race, right? Because none of you discussed. I'd be interested in what was it like for you? I certainly know the trans kids were, when I say minority, it was a very I'm sorry, I didn't look at him. You could count, I don't, have no, I don't know about uh, Caitlin's experiences, but I'd be very interested in hearing you relate to that question. How old was the school? What were the important influences? One, what was the important things that happened one way and then another? And maybe, you know, maybe another, like another whole evening's discussion. <coughs> I think that now there is more intentionality in terms of discussing race, anti-bias curriculum, anti-racist curriculum here, which is really wonderful. Um, I think that that was, for me, um, intuited here when I was growing up here and, live, and uh, going to school here. Um, I know that I felt like this was a safe place for me to go to school uh safer than the, the stories that I heard heard of my parent my mother going to school in the town where we lived uh, I definitely know that there was the feeling of being an only here at Cambridge Friends school um, 
but there is also the feeling often of being an only in the city of Boston and growing up in um, a suburb of Boston. So that was not necessarily different than the town where I grew up. Um, definitely different from where I grew up in Arlington. So one of the other reasons why, so many, there were many reasons why my mom was searching for a school to go to. There was the medical reason. There was Prop 2 and a half, which closed the school that I was going to. So I did not go to a neighborhood public school. My mom, uh, solic after that discussion about the, where the young girls would go, graduate, would go after graduation, high school graduation, um, we, my mom had me go to, or a uh, petition for me to go to a school that was like one district over. Um, in second grade, there I had one racial incident where I was kicked by an older boy, an older white boy. And I remember being super embarrassed. Like it was, I felt shame. I felt like, I, I did not feel I had caused it, but I felt shame and embarrassment that it had happened. And I, I told my mom, and she was like, well, I am going to deal with it. I was like, oh my god, please don't. It was more like, please don't do this, no. She was like, well, yeah. So she called the principal, who was a really wonderful, wonderful man. And he was like, uh, no, I'm going to deal with it. Uh, and how he dealt with it was he went and got the kid, pulled me out of class. And I'm, I'm, and I'm saying this, I'm not, I'm conflicted about how it would, should have been dealt with, not been dealt with, I don't know. Like I, Lynn Pine said, I really don't know. As an educator, I don't know. As a mother, I have, I, I don't know. Um, pulled me out, pulled him out and said um, to him, did you kick Kirsten? And I, I honestly, I can't even remember what he said or didn't say. I knew I w it was true, so it wasn't, I didn't even feel like, I think going back to Imani and Carrie's feeling of like, um, not feeling like, it, I, never, I didn't feel inferior. So I was like, I don't even, I don't even care what this kid says, I know it's true. I felt like my mom knew it was true and I felt like this principal knew it was true. So I was like, I don't care what you say. Um, but that incident in my mind, whether, was a, one of the other reasons why my mom was like, need another place to go, um, not the same. Oh, that place. wasn't here. No, oh no 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 no, was not here. But I, I, it's just a series of events where I think my mom was searching for another place for me to go to school. That particular class that I was in in second grade, those children were wonderful. You're still friends with them. I'm still friends with them. When I left Cambridge Friends School, I went to another public school for a year, and then happened to go back to school um, to that, met all of them up, met up with them, and um, we were in the same like honors cohort going through high school. And when I came back, I remember the first two classes were a little bit rough, because um, I took, my mom made me take typing, best class ever, but I was like, <gasps> so I didn't make, I didn't meet, I didn't meet any of them in typing, and I was like in, uh, because of the Spanish here, I placed higher for Spanish. Didn't see anything in Spanish. Third period, I walk into third period, and all of them were like, Kirsten Greenwich, where have you been for like seven years? Um, so it was a very warm place. But that incident was one of the incidents where my mom was like, no. Um, and I ended up here. And I would have ed probably ended up somewhere, somewhere else, but not there for a little while. I, I will just say, in terms of me and, and race and Cambridge Friends School, I always had kind of this idealistic vision given what came after when I went into public school of being in a classroom and a school that was very accepting, even though there were a lot of black faces. Um, my impression as a child was that everybody was something. So this was like the 80s. So we had kids who were from you know, Vietnam and had literally come from Vietnam or, Cam or, or Cambodia and didn't speak English. And you know, everyone in the class was told that you had to like, go around this kid and make them feel like they belonged. Um, there were kids who were from Haiti in my class um, who were uh, black, black kids, even though it wasn't like an all black school. I never felt like, even though I knew that you know, there weren't as many black people as say other black people who I met out in public who went to like another school, it never felt to me like, 
oh, you're in an all white space. When I got that feeling was when I went to Pueblo school in, again, one of the towns that supposedly has the best public schools in the state. Um, and I was called the N-word for the first time um, by, um, and the teacher in, the in that school was very um, adamant that people in this town, because they had money, couldn't possibly be racist. Um, and so that was my first, that was much more, I think, consequential than being in a space where there weren't as many black faces because I always felt like I was being, like there was like a, a support of some sort and that there were different kinds of people, right, around me. Um, when I went to high school, I went to a prep school, it was a different thing because um, a lot of the kids I went to prep school, the prep school I went to at the time were their parents and their lives were much more, much less concerned about kind of the social consciousness piece of life mm -hmm. and much more concerned about this competitive, you know, everyone's playing lacrosse or whatever. And so that was also eye-opening because um, many of those kids were, um, would say just ignorant things about um, race and class. And it was the 90s, so you know, having this whole argument like, why are you at this school? You're probably an affirmative action kid, all this type of stuff. You know, people would say in the 90s to, to people. So there was a lot, there was that. But I would say Cambridge Friends, for me, my perception as a child was that um, I was in a place that kind of um, enveloped kids, and that even if I, even if there weren't as many black people as you know, when I went to hang out with you know my cousins or something, there was there was like it was a space that was nurturing and a space where I, I belong. I mean, I, I think it's. I mean, that, again, I will go back to the fact that I think you know everyone has to make decisions for their children and decisions on what's best for their child, and particularly um, I think. The education piece in this country is like, you know, I don't envy anybody for having to make that decision because, you know, there's so few um, options for something that has such a big effect on your child's five to 18. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I experienced, you know, really, really bad um, public school situations, really, really bad public school situations with, with race. They weren't at Cambridge Friends. Um, um, and so, in the scheme of things, it wasn't here. It doesn't say you know it was a perfect you know, utopia, but it's to say that those issues that happened did not happen when I was here. Yeah. You know, I went to an independent school as well, and um, it, you know, it's interesting. It was the first place where I was called the N word as well, um, and that was that was uh, an awakening thing. Um, so I guess this is gonna this is gonna lead to my, my next question because those things do hurt and I, but I want to give a final word because we're actually running out of time. Yeah. Um, but for me, the question of this convers whole conversation is our deepest concerns, right? And and if you could just go down the list and give a final word of your deepest concerns, um, and I'll I'll model it and start. Um, my deepest concern is that in our homes. Right now, we are, as, as a black American, I do not feel safe. Right? When you think about what's happening in the news, that I can be eating a bowl of cereal, and I could, and someone knocks on the door, I could lose my life. Um, or I get the same feeling um, when a cop pulls up beside me, and someone knocks on my door. It's the same sort of heartbeat. Um, given, given what's happening in our society today. And I think that, that, is, that, that is very scary. And it's not to say historically that people haven't ex experienced that before, um, but I haven't experienced that to that level. Um, and I think that informs the work that we do. Um, that fear has led me to founding the White Responsibility Conference. Um, and it has influenced my work. What's your deepest concern as a last word? And, how, and I'm sure that that will eventually influence your next work or your next book or whatever so have you. I have to echo the bodily harm um, and the inability uh, for us to see each other as human beings. Because for that to happen, you have the, the light, you have, you, the light has to be completely ex extinguished for you to um, for that to happen in, in Texas, what happened over the weekend? Yes. You have to, the idea that you would, that there's someone in there, a person is in there, to mm -hmm. even say, you know, knock first and say, hello, 
can I help you? Something for that person to even skirt protocol, mm -hmm. that those missing steps in that in that um, uh, body count. Mm -hmm. So it's the the duality of the not uh, the bodily harm, mm -hmm. but then the inability to see each other's human beings is my deepest concern. Wow. Here. Uh, my deepest concern is um, figuring out and mapping the ways that we get free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my deepest concern is um, what the future is going to look like with this level of ignorance that we have, <laughs> just floating around um, in terms of the world. So what, what will, what is the, my deepest concern is what the future is going to look like. When all this passes, which as a historian it will pass, but so then the problem is what will what will we be left with? Friends, Dr. Carrie Greenidge, Kirsten Greenidge, Caitlin Greenidge, <laughs> Dr. Molly Perry. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I think we have books available. I think we've kind of ran over time a little bit. Yeah. So, um, there was supposed to be some, some uh, signing of some books. Um, but I think because of time, if you need a book or would like a book signed, um, could you please see myself or Diane, or you can send us an email, and we can, we can have those books signed for you. Right. Thanks again. Thank you.